Hi, everyone. This is Sam Silverman, Managing Partner of EB5AN. Thank you for taking time to join us on today's webinar. Today, we're going to be discussing EB5 source of funds best practices for Russian investors. Uh, if you'd like to get a copy of these slides, please email us at info at eb5an.com, uh, and we'll be happy to send over uh, a, full, a full copy of the slides. All right. This is a short table of contents of what we're going to cover during the webinar today. First, a short introduction on EB5AN. Then we'll introduce our guest panelist, Charles Rather. Then we'll spend the bulk of the presentation discussing source of funds considerations for Russian investors. We'll spend a few minutes on a real case study uh, involving a Russian EB5 investor. And then we'll spend a few minutes uh, before we conclude discussing our Twin Lakes, Georgia rural EB-5 loan project. A little bit about EB-5AN. Uh, we're a national leading EB-5 investment fund manager. Uh, over 2,000 investors from more than 60 countries have invested through our regional centers over the years. We've been in the space uh, for over 10 years at this point, uh, and we cover uh, the entire continental United States. This is a map showing many of our uh, countries where EB-5 investors have come from over the years, uh, including many uh, from Russia and, and its neighboring countries. Um, this is a map showing uh, many of our regional centers. Uh, actually, just earlier today, we received approval for a number of other states, and we now cover the entire uh, continental United States. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm Sam Silverman, one of the two managing partners of EB-5AN here on the left-hand side and my partner, Mike Schoenfeld, uh, and a little bit about his background and bio is there on, on the right side. And now we'll introduce our guest panelist, Charles Rather of AM Law Group. Charles has been in the EB-5 space uh, for many years, and we've collaborated uh, together on many clients uh, from Russia and neighboring countries over the years. And I'll let Charles jump in in English and in Russian and share a little bit about his experience practicing in the EB-5 space and specifically working with EB-5 uh, investors from Russia and, and neighboring countries. Very good. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, greetings to everybody. And as Sam mentioned, yes, we've been collaborating with EB-5AN for quite some time. Um, and as Sam noted, uh, probably a majority of our clients, uh, both in the EB-5 space and some of the other business immigration categories we deal with, are Russian speakers. So they might be Russians from Russia itself, or they might be of Russian heritage currently living maybe in Western Europe, Turkey, um, even Canada. We're getting an increasing number of clients. Um, and again, as Sam mentioned, when we refer to Russians, we're, we're speaking about the greater area. So that could include obviously investors from Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Armenia, um, et cetera. Um, we're based in the Miami area. Uh, ourselves, uh, but of course we can work with clients no matter where they live, and that's obviously true for uh, Sam and his regional center. You're not tied at all to the geographic area where the project is, where your attorney is, and we work with clients um, regardless of where they are. As far as working with uh, Russian-speaking investors, in particular for the EB-5 program, historically we've had a very large number of uh, clients in this space, and I would say our law firm probably accounts for uh, if not the majority, then a, a very large, sizable chunk of investors from this region. Um, understandably, we're not talking about China or India, where there's literally uh, thousands, if not more, investors per year. Um, but nonetheless, we have a, a very strong track record in working with um, Russian investors. And the reason maybe why that's important is, first of all, we all speak Russian at our firm, in addition to English, obviously. But in addition, we have just worked a lot with investors from this region. We know the accounting documentation, the tax stuff. Uh, and we've had a lot of cases already under our belt dealing with EB-5, so we know exactly, um, again, we don't always know exactly what USAS is going to ask for, but we have a very good idea um, uh, based on prior experience what issues might come up and how to effectively deal with them so that we can get an approval for our clients. Next slide, I guess. Great, great. Thanks, Charles. All right, so now we're going to dive into the core of the presentation. And first, Let's talk generally about source of funds and how does it fit in with the EB-5 program? Why is the U.S. government concerned with documenting where the funds are coming from? And what are the two main components that go into a successful EB-5 application? Go ahead, Charles. Sure. So as you know, Sam, uh, probably the most challenging uh, 
aspect of the work for the EB-5, at least at the first stage when our client is making filing their first petition for the conditional green card, is uh, work related to the source of funds. So the reason behind this, um, th this requirement, I think from a policy level, is that the government wants to make sure that the investor is using clean money, that the investor is using money that has or that can be you know legally documented that they can prove that any required taxes have been paid and that they can show that the money that they're actually putting into the project is specifically that money that's indicated uh in the paperwork um uh, because obviously people can commingle funds or take funds out of a bank and then put it back and so uh, the, the government is very strict about determining that uh where did you get your money from and then determining that that money is exactly those funds that are being put into the project. Um, and as you mentioned, there are two components to this, or two primary components. One is that we have to have a project that uh, documents and shows how all the EB-5 criteria are met. And that's obviously, Sam, where you and your team come in, uh, and you guys have obviously extensive experience in that. And so when we're working with any of your projects, of course, there's really no questions that the project uh, itself meets the requirements of the program. Um, again, that's the work of the regional center and the developer to make sure all the paperwork is in order uh, as far as the project goes. The second aspect of it is showing that the capital is eligible. So um, as indicated here on the slide, we've got to show that the capital was lawfully earned or obtained, um, that it was in fact uh, invested in the project. Again, that all requisite taxes were paid. Um, uh, and then, of course, there's other project-related stuff in terms of job creation and all that that's required. But as far as our clients goes, um, it's, uh, you know, proving the source of funds. And I should make a note that it's, in, it's ironic how often clients say, well, we opened a bank account in Switzerland recently or even in the United States. They checked our money. It's clean. So trust us, you know, there's, no, there's not much work for us to do. And, and I think most clients underestimate what's all involved uh, in preparing the source of funds work. And I think, um, Sam, you guys have done a very good job in trying to educate investors about this. And I think you've had some recent um, uh, articles and even downloads on your website where people can see you know, a sample source of funds uh, memo and see the level of detail that's required. All right, now we're gonna kind of dig into the four main types of sources of funds that are used at a high level. And then we'll spend seven, eight minutes discussing each one in individually. Okay, sure. So on a high level, yes, I think uh, you guys have indicated here for the most commonly used source of funds for uh, EB-5 projects. And I think it's fair to say, although uh, maybe questionable, that they're kind of listed in, in order of, of simplicity, uh, meaning um, I think ordinary income generally is a little bit easier. I guess it depends on the cases. It's a little bit easier to prove than, say, capital gains which sometimes is easier to prove than gifts or inheritance and then loans. Uh, but again, it, it really depends on a lot of factors. Um, but again, here, ordinary income, very commonly that could be salaries, for example, salary bonuses, stuff like that. Um, uh, I would say salaries from our experience are generally one of the easiest uh, uh, source of funds to use. Um, and where possible, we tend to encourage clients to use that if we see that it works out from a uh, paperwork perspective. Capital gains, again, this could be uh, money earned from the sale of real estate or sale of a business. Um, uh, at least with our work with Russian clients from Russian speaking countries, sometimes capital gains can be a challenge because if it's an asset that they've held for a very long time, there can be some problems in terms of getting the requisite paperwork if it's you know 20 years ago, 15 years ago, because back then in many of these countries, um, there just weren't these uh, systems in place, even at a government level, to kind of uh, you know monitor uh, asset values, purchases, taxes, etc. Third option that's indicated here: gifts or inheritances. Um, we're in seeing increasing use of that lately uh, with our clients. Um, so again, it could be money that's gifted outright, um, uh, and it, it, you know could be from a spouse, um, other close relatives, and stuff like that. Um, could be through an inheritance as well. Um, and again, uh, we'll talk a little bit more detail how you provide the paperwork for these. And the last option here, I think, is that's indicated is money that's been lent um, from a third party. So again, that could be from a, a friend or it could be from a bank, a financial institution. And again, that could be with or without collateral. There's pros and cons of that, and we'll go into that a little bit later. Next slide. All right, great. 
So next, let's dig in specifically on ordinary income and talk about best practices to make sure that there aren't any questions on ordinary income sources when an application is getting reviewed by USCIS. Sure, sure. So uh, as indicated here, this could be ordinary income either through self-employment, uh, uh, you know, so if you have a sole proprietorship or if you have third, third party employment. Um, if it's third party employment, meaning you don't have any ownership in the company, that's kind of the gold standard, very easy, generally, generally very easy to collect, you know, that documentation. If you're in Russia, for example, that would be the, the Form 2 NDFL uh, that's most commonly used. Um, and then in addition, we'll have some sample pay stubs. Um, also include maybe an employment agreement uh, or other letter confirming the person's employment, their position, what they've been doing, how long they've worked there, uh, stuff like that. So generally, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that's kind of a rare case for our clients, at least from these uh, this region. Uh, our clients tend to be business owners, have their own businesses, where so they're working for their own business. And so that's where the second option would generally be more relevant, where we'd have to, um, so if this is your own company, uh, like in, in Russian, they'd say IP, uh, so proprietorship, or maybe it's a, an OOO, like an LLC. Um, in that case, we're gonna have to provide uh, all the paperwork for uh, demonstrating the creation of the company. Again, uh, registration documents, um, and then showing uh, documentation confirming the activities of the, of the company. You know, what is it involved in? Um, maybe providing some sample agreements. Um, uh, you know, certainly you definitely have to provide all your tax statements, both for the company and for yourself personally, even if you were just receiving salary. Because again, if you're the owner, uh, or have an ownership stake in that company, then they're going to want to see the corporate documents as well as your personal documents to um, substantiate your uh, your salary. Um, here's kind of FAQ, often questions that come up. Maybe we'll discuss that a little bit more uh, later when we talk about the problems. But again, if this was a business that you owned that, or you do own, but you opened it and you opened it quite a while ago, then yes, there can be more complications, but we're going to have to go back in time, say 10 years ago to when you opened the company. And if you put some capital into the company at that time, 10 years ago, um, we're going to have to prove where that capital uh, came from that you used to launch the business. Again, if you didn't have to invest money, we've had clients sometimes in the service sector, for example, they didn't have to put money in. Uh, and so that was a lot easier to uh, prove. Um, uh, so you're going to need more generally than just your tax returns if this is a company that you have an ownership stake in. All right, great. So now let's let's talk about some of the common problems that come up when dealing with ordinary income. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, problems that can come up with uh, income, especially in these markets, I would say, um, again, we have to get together all of the documentation, um, you know, and obviously everything that's not in English has to be translated into English. Um, we have to get tax returns sh showing source of funds um, and then also tracing uh, the source to the current account as indicated here. So we would have, we would need bank records, bank statements showing that, um, for example, the client received his income, say his salary um, to his uh, bank account. Then maybe it moved from that bank account to another bank account. Um, and then from that account, it went into the project. So we need to show the whole path of funds. Uh, and this is true, not only just for ordinary income, but any types of income. Uh, and therefore, uh, sometimes where we often see problems with clients, especially from this region, is when they uh, take out the money from the bank and just take it out in cash. Because of the unstable, the unstable banking system and similar concerns, people generally in these markets don't keep uh, large amounts of cash in banks for any extended period of time. So uh, we've worked with this for many years and, and I think we have a very good system of, of kind of tracking the money, but just so our clients and listeners here understand that if you receive your salary into a bank account and then you take that money out in cash, then we've got to account for it. Usually clients are able to put the money back into the bank account uh, and they actually have to because they have to transfer the funds into the project, but we have to kind of match out match up all the debits and the credits to show, okay, the client, you know, received say 10,000 this month in salary, he withdrew 10,000 in cash, and then fast forward, you know, six months later or even a year later, okay, he's putting 10,000 back in, and we kind of have to match that up 
back with the, the cash withdrawal that was done earlier. So that is a very common problem that comes up. It's not specific just to ordinary income, but I thought it important maybe to mention it uh, right now at this point so everybody um, is aware of it. Um, and again, I think so, you know, questions that come up, you know, what you, obviously you have to show what taxes you paid, services that you're providing, um, and, you know, what have you done with the funds after you earned them. Great. All right, now let's shift and talk about the second major source of funds which do investors need to be aware of when considering using capital gains fund potential source sure absolutely so capital gains i think um it's a very common uh source of funds for investors from russia and the surrounding area um most often i would say it's from sale of real estate uh, because in these markets over the last couple of years there's been uh, a very steep appreciation in real estate values uh, and people cash out and able to use that uh, money for other purposes. Um, as it's indicated here, um, there's a, you know, a number of documents and unfortunately we can't summarize everything that's required. A, a lot really depends on the individual case because how an investor acquired that real estate also affects all the paperwork uh, that's required. Um, so maybe a simple example is let's just say somebody bought you know one-time purchase of a house 10 years ago, they sold it, you know, this year for a million dollars. They want to use that for their EB-5. So, you know, we've got to show here everything, you know, um, you know, all the, the purchase and sale documents, bank statements showing, you know, funds coming in, funds going out for the purchase, uh, stuff like that. Um, but uh, the, the challenges tend to come up when um, it's usually not that simple of a process. Like as mentioned here on the slide, house flipping is very common, right? People maybe bought the first one 10 years ago, held it for two years, sold that, then bought another one, held that for five years, sold that, got another one. And so uh, what I want to emphasize for clients is we've got to go through that whole chain of all those flippings, of all those purchases to show, okay, where did the money originally come from? It was three apartments ago. Where did the money come for the purchase of that first apartment? And if that goes back in time, 10, 20 years, that can be a problem. Uh, one thing I want to mention, privatization, you know, if you're able to trace back your, your real estate back to the 90s when there was privatization and you or your relatives got their apartment for free, that helps things a lot because obviously you don't have to prove where you got the money for that first apartment. You got it for free from the government. Um, and so uh, that makes things uh, certainly a little bit easier. Um, on the sale of companies, uh, again, I would say we don't have that come up too often. I would say we get dividends from companies, not too often with, with clients selling their companies. But again, here we've got to show that, you know, they have to, uh, that the source of funds, what was the source of funds when they first opened the company? And then when they sold it, you, obviously we need a purchase sale agreement, um, a bank statement showing the money coming in for the sale of the company. Uh, again, providing all the registration docs of the company, evidence that it was involved in a lawful business, um, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Great. All right. Now we'll shift over and the common problems that come up. Sure. Common problems. Uh, uh, again, so uh, problems that can come up increasingly we're seeing with uh, clients from these markets, especially Russia, I would say, it seems like less so maybe some of the other nearby markets, but they're looking for uh, more asset valuations. Um, uh, so if you sold, and I would say generally it's for real estate. I don't think we've ever had a request from USAS for uh, proof of you know any kind of appraisal or asset valuation for the sale of a company or shares. But definitely with real estate, they are almost invariably asking for uh, some kind of appraisal at the time of sale, at least for the most recent transaction. If this, if you did a lot of flipping and you had you know, two or three transactions going back years, they generally go, don't go back into those earlier years. But for the most recent transaction, um, they are asking for um, appraisals, um, which is something relatively new, at least, um, you know, I would say, you know, more than, you know, if you go back more than three years ago, uh, I don't recall uh, them ever asking for that. So that can be, you know, one issue that comes up a lot, at least when you're selling um, real estate. Um, another thing that comes up sometimes when selling real estate is um, involves cash transactions. That's changing for the most part. Uh, so closures, uh, closings for houses, apartments in Russia and these markets generally are now being done through attorneys and the funds are moving through bank accounts. But if you go back, you know, a couple years, especially maybe 10 years for sure, five years, um, transactions were very often done purely in cash. You had a safety deposit box, 
each side had a key to the box. And so, you know, the buyer would put the money in the safe deposit box, then the seller would come by the next day, take out the cash, and that's how it was handled. So um, we've had cases like that. Um, they've always been successful. We just kind of had to document, you know, we'd even go so far as showing here, there was a rental for a, a cash deposit or security deposit box at the bank, um, might get an affidavit from the other side confirming that, you know, it was a cash deal, it wasn't done, payment wasn't made by accounts and stuff like that. So we've never had problems with CIS with that, just sometimes problems documenting that. Uh, from the client's perspective. Um, and again, we've got to show um, the source of funds going back to the original source. Um, you know, how how did you buy the asset originally? Um, what money did you use to purchase it? Um, did you pay all the required taxes? Fortunately in Russia, and I think Kazakhstan, most other markets, if, if it was real estate and you held that real estate for, I believe now five years, you don't have to pay any taxes on the, the uh, capital gains for the sale of real estate. Um, so uh, that makes it a little bit easier in those cases. And then here's the most important thing. And again, this applies to every category that we're going to discuss today, Sam, but commingling, if you see in the last, this third bullet point here, tracing the source to the current account, we're seeing a lot of problems with that lately over the last year. I think it's something that's on USCIS's radar for people from any country, but especially it seems like with Russians in particular, they're really focusing on the commingling of the funds. And so what do we mean by that? We're talking about, uh, let's say you sold your, your house for a million dollars and the money came into bank account XYZ. But if at the time you had another 500,000 there at the bank account and you're not even planning to use the 500,000 for EB-5 purposes, you're using that million that came from the sale of the house they're demanding now explanations and documentation. What's this other 500,000 doing there? Where'd you get it from? And what's the source of funds? Um, I personally think it's it's unreasonable for them to ask for this. And in the past, to be honest, they, they, they weren't so stringent on that, but lately they've become um, sticklers on this. And that is sometimes creating problems for clients who have transactions that occurred in the past before they started contemplating EB-5. And it's too late to kind of create a segregated account where that money should go into. So uh, obviously in cases where the client hasn't sold the asset, where the funds haven't yet hit their accounts, we're emphasizing to them, hey, create a separate account with no history that's totally clean um, and you know, put the funds from the sale, from the capital gains or anything else there to avoid uh, these problems. Okay, great. All right, now let's shift over and talk about the next major category, gifts or inheritance, and how do investors deal with that as a potential source. Sure, absolutely. And I'll try to shorten it up here. I think we're tight on time, but let's try to get to that slide here and then I'll discuss that. Oh, there we go, good. So inheritances uh, or gifts. Um, inheritances are relatively rare. I'd say gifts are much more common, uh, especially between parents and children. Um, so um, again, it, I won't focus too much on the use of a will and inheritance. Uh, it comes up relatively rarely. Uh, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, when you're using gifts, a um, little bit more involved. Again, the person who's gifting the money, um, he or she steps into the place basically of the investor in terms of the, visa, the, the source of funds. So the gift door will have to provide all the evidence that uh, proves where he or she got that money that they decided to give. To give. Um, here it indicates that the evidence can include you know, sworn affidavits, um, uh, but we always, uh, you know, insist on the donors, donors providing information about source of funds as well. In Russia and most of these other countries, um, there's actually a, a, an agreement that technically is supposed to be signed. You, you know, in, in the U.S., you don't have to sign necessarily a gift agreement to make a gift. But in these countries, for it to be binding, you actually have to enter into basically kind of what's called a gift agreement. It doesn't have to be signed by both sides, but usually is. Um, so that makes it a little bit easier to document the actual gift itself. And again, tax regimes vary by country, but I can say at least in Russia, and I believe in the other major markets of this region, but certainly in Russia, any gifts between close family members are not subject to taxes. So there's no gift tax either on the donor or the donee. Um, so uh, that issue you know, makes things a little bit easier uh, in that regard. I think we can discuss Great. now the All right, now problems that come up. Exactly. Yep. Let's shift over to problems. So let's see what problems here we have. So if you've got gifts, um, uh, again, if there's any kind of uh, 
you know, uh, tr transfer taxes that we talked about, you know, those have to be uh, paid or proven. Uh, generally, we get a, uh, an opinion letter from a local attorney uh, that says, you know, you know, generally, if it's a gift between close uh, relatives in these countries, there's no applicable tax, but we still get a legal opinion letter confirming that, so there's no questions from USCIS. If there is a tax that's required to be paid, then of course, the client's gonna have to show that that was paid, um, uh, you know, before moving forward. Um, the uh, Obviously, we, have, we need the bank records as well that show the path of the funds from the gift door to the giftee, um, and again, generally, that's not too much of a problem these days, although um, one thing that can come up, and this is true not only for gifts, but some of the other categories as well, with the sanctions that are currently in place on Russian banks, um, uh, clients need to be very careful what banks they're using. Um, generally, uh, the biggest problem comes up when the money's coming out of Russia. So if the money hasn't left Russia yet, what bank did they use to get the money out of Russia? And we strongly recommend not using a sanctioned bank. Uh, and to be honest, in terms of major banks, there's really only one bank, major bank, that's still actively involved in Russia, Western Bank, um, that can still use SWIFT and is not under sanctions. There are as well a number of regional smaller banks available. So again, if our client uh, has a, you know knowledge of these other banks or has an account with them, that's always an option as well. But most of the large state-owned, Russian state-owned banks are sanctioned. So with very high certainty, we're certain if you take the money out of those banks, if you move the money out of the country using one of those banks, it's probably gonna get denied. Um, now there's a question that's kind of a gray area. If you're using one of the sanctioned banks for internal transactions, um, what will be the result? Um, I don't think there's been any direct knowledge yet just because so uh, little time has passed since the implementation of those sanctions. Uh, but I think later this year or early next year, we're going to see probably some RFEs that maybe might address this. I suspect to be safe, um, we would tell our clients, even for internal transfers, not to use any sanctioned banks. banks. And that can be a problem uh, because, you know, if these transactions happened in the past, before we started doing the source of funds work, it might be too late to make any changes. And so uh, time will tell. But we've already started seeing with RFEs for clients that had filed years ago in Russia, for example, well before the conflict in Ukraine, that USCIS is challenging them uh, on the banks that are being used. And we think their arguments are totally frivolous because, you know, these were transactions made five, six years ago prior to any sanctions being levied. So I don't think those arguments or challenges are gonna stick that CIS is raising, but anything that happened after the implementation of the sanctions, any transactions, those could be uh, uh, vulnerable to uh, you know challenges and might possibly lead uh, to a denial. Great, all right, now let's shift over to problems, or sorry, well, that was problems. Now yeah, we're gonna go over to problems. loans. Absolutely, loans from loans. third parties. Yes, ahead, and I know Rob. you guys. You you guys have had a lot of work with these these kind of structures, uh, and they're becoming more popular, I think, with Russians and uh, other investors from these yep. markets. Sometimes because of the the bank sanctions, the bank sanctions that have been imposed, um, or just some of the issues, just kind of related to the conflict and some of the problems it's created, especially for Russian investors. So, um, you know, you, there's kind of two types of loans that are used in these circumstances, it could be a personal loan, so somebody from a friend of yours, business associate, partner, or um, it could be a loan from a commercial bank. You could also, of course, use a loan from your own company. We've had that sometimes where, say, for the example, the investor has uh, his own proprietary company. That company can also uh, provide a loan. I suspect for tax reasons, maybe, uh, that's not so common in some, some of these markets, so company loans tend to be kind of rare. Uh, in these markets, but certainly having an increasing number of loans from third parties, um, uh, and it could be either from a bank or from an individual. So if you're say dealing with an individual, uh, definitely more difficult, uh, and that individual, again, is, is basically uh, stepping into the shoes of the investor in the eyes of USCIS. So that person who's lending the money, they're gonna have to sh you know, show their whole books and everything. Where did they make this money that they're giving that they're lending, um, they're gonna have to show the path of funds, how they earn the money, uh, how you know it, it moved around prior to being uh, committed or, or loaned to uh, the uh, the investor. Um, and so some of those documents are all indicated here. Um, 
using a bank loan is uh, certainly easier, uh, but there can be complications with that. So there's obviously two types of loans you could have with um, uh, a bank, uh, could be collateralized or non-collateralized. Um, non-collateralized, obviously much easier to source uh, and the paperwork, but probably in reality more difficult to secure. And so that's kind of up to the personal relationship the client has with his or her bank uh, and on what terms they'd be willing to provide uh, a uh, non-collateralized loan because if the investor has to provide collateral and again doesn't matter if it's through a bank or from a friend that they get the loan if the investor is providing some collateral then um, the investor's got to prove where they got the money for that collateral and so oftentimes that really doesn't even help help the situation so I would say people use loans generally when they don't have to provide collateral um, to make things a little bit easier um, uh, as for the loan terms, um, banks probably are less flexible about the loan terms than uh, if you're getting it from an individual. If we're getting it from an individual, uh, you can play more maybe with the interest rate. Um, you really need to have some kind of interest rate. Uh, we've never gotten much push, pushback as to what that rate should be. Um, and, uh, and it's going to have to have more or less market terms. Uh, you know, that, you know, they, you know if, if you're late on a payment, they might be able to accelerate. Uh, repayment of the loan, et cetera. But again, you can customize the loan, uh, at least if you're working with uh, an individual, a third party, a friend, uh, to meet the needs of the investor. And so what we try to do is, sure, we might push off all interest payments until, you know, uh, repayment of the loan, the, the loan principal itself. And we might make it a very long-term loan, you know, so that there won't be questions about, um, you know, making payments or covering the entire loan, you know, in three or four years, how is the client or investor going to do that? So we tend to make the, the, the tenure very long. So there's no questions about, you know, how are they going to repay the loan? How are they going to make interest payments? Uh, the more we can push that off into the future, the less questions uh, you'll get from USCIS. I think we can do the next slide. Great. All right. Now we'll we'll talk about common problems with loans, and then we'll we'll shift over to something else and and talk about the case study. Absolutely, sounds good. So to wrap up here, kind of common problems with loans. Um, uh, again, uh, you might have to prove uh, again. The, the the biggest problem I see with the loans is. If you're using collateral, then you're going to have to provide source of funds information as to how you got the money to acquire that collateral. That's why, obviously, if you're using a loan, it's generally preferable not to use collateral. Um, if you're getting uh, the loan from an individual, uh, you should probably be really clear with that person up front, maybe having a consult with us and with the client together so everybody's on the same page, what's going to be required from the uh, lender if it's an individual your friend your business partner because a lot of times unfortunately we've had a case where we start the process everybody's okay and then we start talking to the partner who's going to give the money um, and he's finding out what he's got to give and he had no idea the, the level of detail and documentation he'd have to provide so it's better to get that all up open and, and handled uh, at, at the beginning of the process and if you're getting a loan from a bank uh, like we said if you can get it without collateral it makes life a lot easier there can be problems with finding a bank that might agree to that. Um, but again, a lot of our clients sometimes have long-term relationships with those banks that they might be able to uh, reach an agreement with them uh, and handle it that way. Great. All right, now let, let's shift over to a real life example and talk about the types of documents and steps that would be needed to actually document an investor source of funds. In mm -hmm. this case, we've got a, U.S. national, who's a friend of the EB-5 investor, and this investor or this U.S. national has been operating a digital consulting business here on the right side, earning income, and has a Russian friend who owns a piece of property in Moscow and has agreed to make a loan secured by that real estate asset in Moscow. Um, so in this situation, Charles, do you want to kind of walk us through what are the different types of documents that are going to be needed for both the investor and and the U.S. friend, and then you know kind of the peripheral biographical documents as well that that were going to be needed. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll I definitely try to discuss this, and if and if you think I've overlooked anything, Sam, let me know as well. Um, so uh, the lender, so the friend uh, in the U.S., let's say he's a lender. Um, you know, he's going to have to provide 
documentation, uh, certainly about his business. He's got this di digital consulting business. So certainly he's going to have to um, prove, and maybe I'm starting, I'm starting from the other end. Maybe I should start from, from the Russian side of things, but let's, let's maybe go from this end and, and we'll work our way backwards and hopefully it'll be fine. So if the friend is lending the money, he's got to show uh, that, you know, what kind of business he has as indicated here, you know, all the incorporation documents, um, his EIN, um, show that, uh, you know, what kind of services he's been providing, provide uh, tax returns for a uh, relevant uh, period in question, um, both, uh, I, I would think, for both for the business uh, and certainly his personal tax returns, because he's got to prove that um, his source of funds was from uh, this business of his that he owns. He received those funds uh, individually, pays taxes from them uh, on his 1040, um, as part of his, his income. Uh, and then we need to provide, obviously, bank statements showing not only the uh, the earning of those funds, you know, as they were uh, transferred, for example, to his personal account from the business account, uh, either in the form of either salary, dividends, or a combination, but also then providing uh, uh, bank statements um, showing ultimately then uh, showing the accumulation of these funds on his personal bank account uh, prior to lending them to his friend overseas. Um, I would suggest generally given, you know, the tax regime and documentation in the U.S., this side of the equation is, is probably relatively easy because, uh, again, assuming he's not running his business under the radar in the U.S., et cetera, um, he's going to be in compliance with all uh, the required tax, you know, obligations, both in, both for his company personally, both for his company and for himself personally. So I think here on this side of, the, of things, things should be pretty uh, straightforward. And then let's say he decides to uh, loan the funds uh, to his friend and the friend provides, you know, some collateral. So the collateral would be, say, the real estate. They would need, obviously, a, a loan agreement um, and also uh, indication that uh, this uh, real estate would be used as, as collateral, um, as well as maybe a personal guarantee on top of that. So um, the, the government wants to see, obviously, that there's a clear path that in the event of non-payment that the uh, the American friend who's the lender would have a clear path to collect on the asset in the event of a default. Um, I think uh, in reality in these markets, given some of the challenges um, uh, with you know securing uh, a lease or a lien, I'm sorry, securing a lien on property in Russia, I think it's generally I would say problematic, but just a bit of a headache. And so at least from our experience, I think a lot of times people would just do uh, an uncollateralized uh, loan uh, in this kind of situation. Um, if the uh, in, if we do use the scenario of using collateral, then obviously the Russian investor is going to have to show obviously his personal documentation, you know, his passports, driver's license, all that other stuff. But more importantly, showing, OK, here's the real estate that we have providing an appraisal that, that confirms its value uh, and then show um, what, you know, and what, what manner, how that person actually received the funds for uh, the apartment or, or real estate that's being used to secure the loan. So, again, that gets back to everything we talked about earlier that, you know, um, you know, if they flipped homes, then we might have to go back several iterations to show how the person got the funds to buy this particular house because he had sold a previous one and a previous one uh if it was from you know his salary and he saved up enough to buy this real estate uh that's a little bit easier generally and so that's where we'll have to go through one of the uh, iterations that we discussed previously about uh you know the source of source of funds um and then obviously showing um you know payment uh payment of the funds going from the um, the lender that's in the U.S. to uh, the Russian national. And I would suspect, given the current uh, political and economic client, there's very few people that want to be sending money into Russia right now. So uh, in this scenario, I think it probably would only be realistic if the investor had an overseas account to which the uh, U.S. friend could send the uh, loan funds to, because getting the money into Russia I would say that in itself is a, a big feat. Like I said before, there's only one bank right now that's you know using uh, SWIFT, and so if the Russian investor doesn't even have an account at that bank, I think you know that's not even an option.
there you go, Sam. I think we discussed that. Great. All right. Now let let's talk a little bit about the EB five source of funds cover letter. What what is a cover letter? How is it used? And how does it fit together with all of the documents that an investor is going to need to produce? So right, uh, the cover letter is. Uh, I, I'd actually we usually call it a memo because a letter kind of seems to diminish its size. I mean, these memos can can be quite detailed and lengthy. Um, and the purpose of this is, you know, the memo consists of information related to the project to show the officer that the project, you know, meets the qualifications and the requirements of the program. Um, and that information obviously is provided by you guys. Um, and from our side, by our work with the investor, we have to provide uh, information about the um, uh, source of funds. And so this is where all of, all of it comes together. Those two parts we talked about at the beginning of our presentation, the project documentation and the source of funds. This is, this is the document where it all kind of comes together and we kind of take the officer by the hand and explain to him or her, okay, this is the project. These are the requirements that it satisfies, job creation, you know, TEA, possibly other things. And this is the funds that are being invested into the project and what their source is. And this is where we go through a very detailed narrative of, uh, and I've seen, I, I'm, I'm amazed, and maybe I shouldn't be amazed because mostly they, they led to denials, but when clients had problems with other um, uh, attorneys that they worked with, I, I mean, I would see source of fund uh, letters where the, the actual source of funds is literally a paragraph or two. Um, and so, um, not surprisingly, those those didn't uh, you know fly through. Um, so this is quite detailed where we go through, and especially when we're dealing with our investors from these markets where things aren't as always transparent as they are in Western markets, we have to go through all the details. How did the person earn the money? What source did we use? Like we talked about the, th the four most common sources earlier today. Um, what source did they use? Um, how did that money, you know, we put all, all together, the path of the funds, the source of the funds, and we have to show everything, how it moved, where it went uh, before it arrived in the project's, uh, you know, trust account. All right, great. And just, just for reference, this is a list of some of the types of exhibits that may be needed for one of these source of funds cover letters or memos, just to give an idea Obviously, this is going to vary based on mm -hmm. the exact sources that are being used, but just to give a general uh, idea of the number and kind of types of documents that are going to be attached and included as part of the filing. All right. Now, but before we wrap up, we'll spend a few minutes um, on the Twin Lakes, Georgia Rural EB5 project, uh, and then we'll, we'll hear a little bit more from Charles uh, at, at, at the very end. So the Twin Lakes, Georgia Rural EB5 project is a single family home community with amenities. It's located just outside Atlanta, Georgia. It's a active adult uh, master plan retirement community with 1300 homes total. Over 550 of the homes have already been sold and over 400 homes have already been built uh, and delivered to buyers. The project's being developed by the Coulter Group. They're one of the largest privately owned developers uh, in the Southeastern United States. They have over 20,000 in process and developed homes. Construction is already well underway, as you can see from the photo here. In total, the project will create almost 7,000 EB-5 eligible jobs, and over 2,000 of those jobs have already been created uh, as of June of, of this year. Total project cost is almost $700 million, and EB-5 uh, loan funds are approximately 12% of, of the total cost. This project is located in a rural area, uh, which means that it qualifies under the new law for priority processing, faster approval, and a 20% visa set aside, which is particularly impactful for investors from India and China, uh, which face um, backlogs due to high, high demand from those countries. This project follows 14 prior EB5AN Coulter EB5 projects. Um, many of them are located in the southeast and have already received uh, USCIS approvals uh, in them. Twin Lakes is one of 13 Cresswin branded active adult retirement communities. Coulter has focused on this niche of the market, active adult retirement, and developed this Cresswin brand uh, to target that segment of the market. So they have 13 different active communities now in various stages of development, some already completed, others in process, 
like Twin Lakes, um, but it's a proven business model, building and selling new customized homes to active adult 55 and up uh, re retirees. Under the new law that we mentioned earlier that went into effect about a year and a half ago, uh, investors already in the United States on H-1B, E-2, F-1, and L-1 are now eligible for concurrent filing, which means that they can apply and receive a work permit an EAD and a travel authorization document within just a few months of making their EB-5 investment. This is a new feature that was not previously available prior to March of 2022, um, but it is a very powerful new uh, benefit for investors already in the US because now within just a few months, they can obtain this very flexible work permit EAD that will allow them to change jobs, quit, take a vacation, have complete employment, uh, flexibility and control over their professional career. And they're getting that within just a few months while they're waiting for the green card to be processed and approved by USCIS. The Twin Lakes project also features several unique safety features, uh, which differentiate it from other rural EB-5 projects available in the market, um, namely an EB-5 loan repayment guarantee. This increases the safety and likelihood of timely repayment of EB-5 funds an I-5 to 6 approval refund guarantee, um, which provides for accelerated repayment of funds if an I-5 to 6 petition is not approved for any reason, and also a job, uh, job creation guarantee. All of these guarantees are all being provided uh, from one of Coulter's parent holding companies, KL Holdco, uh, and we're happy to share all the financial statements for that, for that company. One thing um, that's also important to note is that within this specific market, the Atlanta metro area, where the Twin Lakes project is located, uh, Coulter is the number one home seller. So in 2022, Coulter sold more homes than any other developer, uh, including Lennar and Polta Group, which are two of the largest publicly traded uh, home builders in the United States today, even bigger than Coulter. And despite that, Coulter still sold more homes um, than, than them in this particular market. Um, so Coulter has really identified a niche and a specific strategy that's, that's allowing it to outperform its competitors. And just uh, about two months ago, Warren Buffett uh, recently announced a major investment of almost a billion dollars in two of Coulter's primary competitors, Lennar and DR Horton. Obviously, Warren Buffett, uh, although he may have wanted to invest in Coulter, he couldn't have because they're a private company. Um, but that type of a significant recent investment uh, is really a testament to the investment thesis that given higher interest rates, a lot of homeowners are not willing to sell their homes because then they would have to get a new mortgage and rates are very high. And so that's causing a lot of homeowners to just stay where they are and is resulting in a shortage of homes available for new home buyers. And so a lot of these new home builders uh, like Lennar, DR Horton, NVR, and Coulter are really well positioned to capitalize on this trend of shortage of, of, of homes available, essentially. And so Warren Buffett you know, has obviously knows what he's doing, has identified this trend, and has you know, put almost a billion dollars to work. Uh, and so EB-5 investors can essentially piggyback on the same investment thesis that these single family home builders are gonna do very well uh, over the next five to 10 years with an investment in, in the Twin Lakes project. Uh, recently, um, we visited the project and, and put together a driving tour, a virtual driving tour. Um, so many investors unfortunately are out of the United States at the time they make their investment. And so it can be difficult to come for an in-person visit However, you know, to help kind of address that need to get a feeling for what's happening on site, we've put together this virtual driving tour that you can access on, on our website. And for investors who can um, make it to see the project in person, it is open seven days a week, and we're happy to arrange for a private tour of, of the entire project and, and its amenities as well. These are a couple of recent photos showing current construction. And you can see here they're clearing uh, some of the land for, for a new street of homes. Also available on our website, we have a number of EB-5 investor testimonials uh, where you can watch and read uh, 
different investors share their opinions on why they decided to pursue an EB-5 investment and also specifically why they chose uh, to invest in, in the Twin Lakes project. These are also all available on, on our website. And so be before we wrap up, um, I wanna turn it back over to Charles and have him share a bit more high level about his experience with Russian uh, EB-5 investors and you know generally why um, are interested in an EB-5 investment, what are the benefits um, you know, that he hears from his clients. And then, you know, for investors who are interested in exploring whether or not an EB-5 investment is possible and what documents uh, would be needed to make that happen, um, I'll let him share a little bit more information about what that process would look like, timing, and, and how to get in touch. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Sam. Um, so I think one thing that unites all of our clients, regardless of what country they're from or even what visa they're looking at, is a desire to um, create uh, new opportunities and stability and safety for their children and their families. Um, even when you're looking at EB-5, where it involves a relatively sizable investment, um, for the most part, I would say our EB-5 clients are pretty well off in their home countries. They've had a successful career, successful, successful business that they've developed over the years, and they've reached a certain level of status and income that makes for a comfortable life. But despite that, they're still concerned about uh, the future of their children, uh, security issues maybe, possibly their own you know, security uh, in the direct sense or maybe kind of in a broader sense. And that's kind of what drives a lot of people to look at EB-5. Um, regardless of whether from China, Russia, India, and, and whatnot. Um, so uh, that is a common component we always see. And I think EB-5 is so effective in reaching that goal um, in the sense that we often have clients that come to us just for a non-immigrant visa. They want to come here for a little bit, uh, you know, maybe for an E2, come to the U.S. for three, five years, go back home. Um, and we often get, we kind of call them recycled clients because they'll come here as come to us for a for initial visa, maybe, you know, an E2, and then, you know, they're here for a couple of years, they extend that, we help them with that. And then they re realize, hey, we, we kind of want to stay here, but the E2 really doesn't offer a good long-term option for a green card. And so I think uh, the advantages of the EB-5 uh, consist of the fact that, you know, you can kind of directly make this move to your end goal without going through this circuitous path of using some intermediary visas and investing in another business and it turns out that business isn't going to be adequate for you to get a green card and blah 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 so i think that's what uh, is driving a lot of the interest in uh, eb-5s uh, because it helps our clients kind of more quickly and adequately reach that final goal of providing long-term um, opportunity and security uh, for their children the other thing I wanted to mention also, so as, I think in light of the, the changes, and you mentioned some of the set aside, Sam, that I think EB-5 is increasingly interesting and popular because A, you can adjust status while you're here while waiting uh, adjudication, which you mentioned. And secondly, uh, especially the Twin Lakes project is in a rural area that with the expedited processing that we're already seeing occurring for these types of projects, that makes the EB-5 uh, even more uh, appealing. So again, clients can stay here while they're awaiting adjudication. You know, God forbid it's going to take three or four years, but that, that sometimes happens. Um, but if you're here basically during that time and able to enjoy all the, you know, basically rights of a green card holder, uh, that is a big positive. And then secondly, the fact that um, uh, with expedited processing for rural projects, that's a big plus that people can actually get through the process much faster. In terms of the processing and how it all goes, just so people know, generally we kind of start the process off um, uh, with uh, doing a preliminary call consultation with the client to find out what exactly their background is. Do they meet all the requirements? Um, are they aware of the, the, the process for the EB-5, what's kind of required of them, what the waiting times are and stuff? Um, but more importantly, we talk about their, their source of funds, potentially, um, oftentimes with clients from Russia in these markets, one call is not enough to kind of get into the nitty gritty of the source of funds. Oftentimes the first call is just to give them a, a you know overall view of what's required and give them an understanding. And then we often have to have a follow-up call where we kind of get into the nitty gritty of their actual holdings, uh, business earnings, um, you know, real estate, stuff like that to really determine uh, that they're going to be able to 
A, provide source of funds, and B, also show the path of funds, because with path of funds, there can also often be problems in some of these markets. So I think generally the conversation starts with that. If we feel comfortable, again, without looking at documents, because that takes a lot of time, but if basically taking the client at his or her word, you know, what's their situation? What's the documentation that they have? If we feel confident that, yes, we think we could prepare a good case, uh, then we would, you know, go forward with, uh, you know, signing the retainer, start working on, on the source of funds and the path of funds. And in the meantime, obviously, you know, they would get in touch with Sam, you and your team to talk about, you know, what offerings you have at that time on the market. Um, and of course, you know, that process on the project side goes a lot quicker. So I think usually we want to get comfortable on the source of funds after we start getting some documents and feel comfortable that, yes, everything looks like it's good. Once we feel comfortable at that, obviously, then they can start working with you guys at the regional center uh, to work on the subscription docs and, and kind of get things going um, at that point. I would have to say that from our experience working with Russian investors um, or that from that region of the world, you know, we're looking at, you know, best case scenario, unless it's a super urgent case, you know, best case, I would say three months to kind of get all the paperwork together with including translations and stuff like that. I would say on average, it kind of takes three to six months on average to get everything together. Depends on the client, complexity, how quickly they can get stuff to us, but that's the general time frame. Great. Thank you very much, Charles. Really, really appreciate you taking the time today to walk us through that. Yep. And yeah, Thank you. If Anyone has any questions related to immigration, the EB-5 process, documents needed, please reach out to Charles. He's the expert. His contact information is there on the right-hand side of the screen. And any questions about any EB-5 projects, investment opportunities, uh, how to diligence projects, et cetera, please uh, feel free to reach out to EB-5AN. Uh, and yeah, we hope this is helpful for you. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure, Sam.